All right. Hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you from San Diego. And today I am delighted to be joined by Kyle Duford, who is in Greenville, South Carolina. How are you doing, Carl? Kyle. Doing well, thanks. How are you? I'm doing excellent. And Kyle is the agency director of the brand leader. And we're going to talk about we're going to talk about brand today. So um, let's get straight into it, Kyle. Let's talk about brand like pre-pandemic and then, uh, um, then post-pandemic or whatever. Sure. Um, even pre-pandemic, were you seeing changes in how uh, people are perceiving or approaching branding as maybe they did, you know, 10, 20 years before? Yeah, I mean, in a big way. First of all, thank you so much for having me on my on your show. Um, I'm jealous you're in San Diego. Um, there's a there's people talk about branding in different ways, and they all mm -hmm. interpret it different things. But if you think about what branding is, is just an emotional connection between a business or service or product with its consumer or with people. It doesn't have to be a consumer, actually. Uh, then you just realize it's just about connections and relationships. And so, to answer your question, 15, 20 years ago, those relationships were. They, you know, they were predicated on physical relationships and contact and meeting people in retail stores and talking to the, you know, the person at Sears and your mailman. And nowadays it's such a digital world that we are already evolving into this relationship with the brand in its digital manifestation. Or it, it could be through an app. It could be through something else. And you still have those touch points. You still go to Starbucks and those things. But uh, it was influenced by how the brands appear in other forms and how they're talking about them and if they've been canceled or not or what their spokesperson said. So it was evolving anyway pre-pandemic. Um, it's just kind of gotten a little bit weirder since then. But yeah, there has been a shift just because we've all been shifting naturally into this digital world. Yeah, yeah, no, it's interesting because yeah, you're correct. I mean, how we how we interact with, with brands ha has changed so much. And as you said, now... We tend to look at things as a, you know, our overall, if you like, customer experience or brand experience. So it goes everything from the human element to, you know, interacting with their app or whatever it is. So there's right. so many different. So, I mean, that raises challenges, doesn't it, in many ways for companies to have a very, uh, a very well-defined, uh, well-defined brand that everybody in the organization understands. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're saying the right things today because uh, you're right. It's everyone in the organization. You kind of almost had to. It's it's almost kind of like your brand dictates a set of rules that you need to follow. And if you're not doing that internally, then uh, then it's really difficult to have all these uniform, consistent touch points across all your relationships and, and how you meet people. So uh, you're absolutely right. It, it, it is uh, the brand strength. While it might be defined ultimately by your user, it has to be adhered to by the people who claim to be right in the backs of it, if you will. So it's it's a it's a weird thing, but the you know you just mentioned apps and so forth. There's there's still something tangible there, even though you're interacting with your iPhone, which is very personal. You know, studies have been sh shown for years that the closer you hold something to yourself, the more personal it is. Like if you wear a dress or that you wear a backpack, the, the thing's closer to your body. When you can't get closer than a phone, right? We have it everywhere, so it's very personal. And when you have a bad experience on that device no matter through whatever what means it might be, even a phone call, uh, it leaves a psychological mark that is a negative attribution to that brand or thing that you're doing with. So you mentioned apps. Uh, if you have a bad, we've all had this experience. You love the brand, the apps, shit. Or maybe you would say shite, yeah. right? So the, <laughs> what, what, would, what, what does that do to you as a consumer, potential consumer or brand advocate or brand maven, whatever? So you have to be very careful and... Um, yeah, it's it's an interesting world, right? We live in because it's there's so many touch points you could as a customer or consumer can see or be a part of. And from the brand, there might even be more that you have to kind of guard against to make sure that you understand what the response is uh, or how you prepare. It's very interesting territory for sure. Yeah, no, it is. I mean, I had an experience like that recently. I think it was even in a zoo or something. Maybe it was the San Diego Zoo, which is like great. And it's, it's a great zoo and everything. And I downloaded the app, but the app was terrible. And it was pretty much unusable when I was in the in the in the park, and yeah, it's a it's it's that when you get those, you're excited about something, and then you get disappointed by one element of it. And I think mm -hmm. that that yeah. goes back to what we're talking about: is it's not a unified experience, and perhaps 
you know, they probably outsourced the app that someone never thought about, like, what is the real yeah. user experience here? And is it the one that we cr try to create within the park itself? Well, I mean, you just, I mean, that's, you couldn't come up with a more perfect example. And because you literally experienced that, that's amazing. Uh, well, the experience wasn't, but um, you say, who's the, what's the best zoo in the country? And, and unless for some reason you work for your local zoo, almost mm -hmm. everyone universally says the San Diego zoo in a lifetime, you mm -hmm. have to go there. I'm making this up, whatever they've done more for yeah. pandas or elephants yeah, or something, yeah. but you just know, it's great. It's amazing. You know, it's, it's not just a zoo, it's a preserve and they rehabilitate animals and it's just, it's part of woven into American consciousness. Yeah, you know, that's yeah. a great thing. So you go expecting premier um, apps, premier clean uh, walkways, uh, uh, premier ticket uh, systems. You want, want the animals to be well cared for. And if one of those things, and you just nailed it on the head, if one of those things goes wrong and, and it was awful for you, <laughs> it just leaves this indelible mark that you can't remove from that relationship. And you might always say to somebody, Love the zoo. Go to the zoo when you come to visit John, but just uh, just use the map because the, yeah. the app sucks, right? Yeah, which is funny because that's exactly what we did. We went back and grabbed the, the paper map. So you go it's quite, it's, yeah, yeah, we just went back to find where are the paper maps. So let's use those. Um, but yeah, I mean, and I think that's the thing that uh, that uh, a lot of organizations still struggle with because they still think that branding and all of that, you know, that that's belongs in the marketing department and they talk about these things and they don't realize that it's a it's a living breathing thing and and how it evolves over time because i noticed when i was uh, reading your bio uh you know your work with dr martin's right yeah yeah and, a long time with dr. And yeah and and i have to say like dr martin's because i passed by uh, a dr martin's store actually up in la the other day and it just it just struck me like the whole array of 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 the different footwear if you're not familiar with dr martin's that um, or Doc Martens or DMs as we used to call them, but the whole array and the fashion and the price and everything and how, and I'm looking back and thinking, okay, I got my first pair of Doc Martens when I was about 12 or 13 years old. And, uh, you know, wait, and that's a lot, <laughs> that's a long time ago. And Doc Martens for a long time were, yeah, oh, you know, we're, they were associated, we wore them, there were punks and skins and skinheads and all of that. That was the Doc Martens. And now it's blossomed into this, like, you know, very fashionable. And, and it's amazing that transition to see a transition of a brand like that. You know, it's, uh, I, I could talk to you about this for hours, but because mm -hmm. it's, it's so fascinating because of where you grew up at Belfast or Dublin? Dublin. Okay, I was trying to say, trying to connect the accent there. Um, some of my favorite runs are in Dublin, right through that main temple area. I, I love it. Oh, right. But for you, we're, we're about the same age, I would guess. And back then, especially in in uh, London and, and England, maybe not necessarily the general UK, but Dr. Martin's meant to our generation. My grandfather wore them in the factory. Yeah. My dad wore them as a cop. I wore them because the Clash wore them, or because you know maybe yeah. in your case you wanted to you know, celebrate uh, the uprising of the, you know, the Irish, you know, nationalism, you know, that whole idea or, you know, um, I, I'm not confronted at all, but, you know, Bono wore them first time he was on playing Red Rocks in the U.S. And it, mm -hmm. that that transition came kind of later in life. We didn't get them in the U.S. until the mid 80s. So these, they had this iconic heritage brand was had its own meaning and they tried to put that meaning on to the folks in the U.S. and didn't work. What did work was this red thread through everything, what they call this rebellious self-expression. So it almost didn't matter that you were a punk in uh, a punk kid in London or in Dublin or in New York City. It didn't matter what your grandfather did or what the legacy of the boot was. You could be the first generation owner in the U.S., but you still had this rebellious streak to you. And that rebellion could be just in the fashion world. It could be that you want to wear your docks to work. It doesn't necessarily mean you want to put your your cherry reds on and go kick the snot out of someone. <laughs> it's, and, but that's the thing is, but they took a, a long time, and I I'd like to think I was part of this in the U.S. Understanding that you can you can convey a brand's meaning to a different audience in a different way and still hold true to its origin, and mm -hmm. and you put the perfect example for that because that's what we would call like voice and tone on a brand, it's the voice is the same, but the way you speak about it, the tone, the tonality to the US consumer was much different than the one uh, in the UK or mainland Europe. So uh, yet, yeah, but you have to guard against that because it could have been seen as, oh, these are skinheads who wear the skinheads in the US mm -hmm. sense, not the British sense. Yeah. Um, and, and therefore they're no good. But if you looked at yeah. that as just, it could be adopted by any 
uh, sub or counterculture as a identifier of their self-expression, well, then it makes sense, right? So it's pretty cool. No, it is. And I think it's a great example, too, of, of as you said, I mean, how it, they were able to, and you obviously were a big part of it, how you're able to mainstream it without losing that kind of rebellious edge. Um, and it's still it's still funny because I, I still notice, uh, you know, a friend of my son's, like a few weeks ago, you know, showed up and um, she was wearing Doc Martin boots and I was immediately, oh, hey, DMs. She thought I meant direct messages, but that's okay. Um, uh, but it's uh, but like it's it's amazing how you were able to, as I said, mainstream it like, uh, uh, but without losing certain attributes. Well, it, there's a lot of people involved in that, um, obviously, and some people much smarter than me. But I, I like to count myself as one of the lucky ones on that project. But from a digital sense, my team was definitely a big part of that. And there was a lot of there's a shift from the U.S. market being almost the headquarters. Um, in the early, probably late to early 90s, I would say, late 80s, early 90s, to moving it back um, to the home ground to be a little bit more authentic. And when they did that, the the UK folks, and God love them, they're wonderful people, some of my closest friends to this day, but they were like, nope, this is the messaging. This is the campaign. But you can tell when something's a little bit inauthentic and just like you experienced at the zoo. It just didn't feel mm-hmm. like you even said it might have been a third party. You wouldn't have said that unless you unless it felt like it was something from the zoo right so um they try to put all this meaning behind it which which we didn't we weren't even aware of in the us and so a lot of the marketing team and my team and and again some people smarter than me decided to reshoot all the campaigns in the us so the the people look like i mean and and this is no offense it's a compliment because i'm a a big anglophile but um or maybe irishophile is that a a word (laughs) but you have a very distinct look you have a very you know uh English, Irish, kind of that part of the world look to you. And when you're in a photograph representing a US market, it's very clear that's wrong. And so we had to adjust it. So again, keeping the same thread of the brand and what the brand means doesn't mean the execution of it needs to look the same. And that's what a lot of brands get wrong. And it could be a brand that's a small neighborhood brand, or it could be a, a worldwide global icon. It doesn't matter. You still have to make sure that you're talking to the right group of people in the voice they're expecting you to talk to them in. If that makes sense, no, it totally makes sense, and I think that's that's the other big, big challenge because, uh, I mean, nowadays most, you know, the majority of businesses are global, even small businesses because the internet, you know, because you can go online and you can talk to, a, you can sell to a global audience. Sure. Uh, so that obviously raises the challenges that you're just talking about. Is that uh, you have your brand, how you express your brand may be different in different parts of the world and 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 trying to have that trying to maintain like a brand identity and at the same time uh, be able to nuance it i mean that's that's quite a challenge isn't it it's a it's a massive challenge and w- the larger you get the more difficult it is because you can have a u.s brand a real firm u.s brand and take nike for example uh, although they've been international almost since day one but uh, it has a very u.s iconic American feel to the US advertising. You go look at them overseas and the challenge is not only coming in with this American monkey on your back into another market, especially maybe a smaller market like uh, the Philippines or someplace which buys buys the running shoes all the time, uh, or some places in Africa, even Egypt, where the American, you know, colonialization of the world kind of has a, you know, a a negative connotation to anyone who kind of enters a country and they have to assimilate to that culture in that culture's way without losing sight of who the brand is. So take Nike, for example, they have a very particular way of defining who an athlete is and an athlete is, and these are my words, not theirs, but an athlete primarily is anyone who wants to be an athlete, who thinks of themselves as an athlete. doesn't matter what color your skin, what your sexual orientation, your, you know, racial ethnicity, anything, including your athletic ability. If you feel you're an athlete, you're an athlete. That resonates across the globe. So instead of going into, you know, even Ireland and say, we're Nike, you should follow us. They go in and say, hey, you're an athlete. I'm an athlete. Let's run together or let's cycle together. Let's play basketball together. And it's this uniform message. You have to always boil down a brand, no matter who it is, down to its core values and who they see themselves as being. And then invite other people to join you. And, it, and if you do it right, it works. And it, it, and you all the other stuff is noise, right? And we didn't yeah. even mention the logos or the 
way they answer the phone or the orange boxes or anything like that, because it almost doesn't matter. Um, yeah. It's it's meet people where they need to be met and then build it from there. So that's the challenge. But brands who do it right have a lot of money and have the opportunity to go in and listen to the culture. And then that's the you know, it's kind of a metaphor for humanity, really. Yeah, no, it is. It is. And, and I'm glad you mentioned the logo thing, because I, I tend to say this when we talk branding is just that there's a lot of people who still think that logo is branding and uh you know they go oh well that's the brand you know our logo and they go no it's not it's um, you know your brand is is everywhere yeah. you in- interact but here's a just just an interesting question for you is um since the pandemic or during the pandemic mm-hmm. post pandemic or wherever we are right other other pandemics whatever um have you seen uh, have you seen any shift in in how some people are approaching brand are you having conversations maybe with clients or saying that you know maybe we need to evolve our brand a little bit or because i mean we've been through the first really global collective experience right mm-hmm. i mean you could say you could say well you know there were world wars well there were but they weren't actually world wars there were places like you know south america that was untouched and whatever so right. but right. this has touched everybody and maybe made us question a little bit about you know where we were going and all of that and 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 i think people are craving more real connection and that kind of stuff so have you um, are you seeing an impact of the pandemic on branding i mean it's a that's a packed question um <laughs> there's you know i can either be a, a, in my life in general i can either be a cynic or i can be really empathetic and mm-hmm. for me i looked at that situation personally as you know during the actual lockdown stay at home order when no one was outside which is just a weird eerie feeling and everyone it would happen to everybody my I, i've got six children and uh four of them were home mm-hmm. during that time period the rest yeah. were locked up in college and they all said when everyone went back home or went on their own way or the doors opened, they all said, uh, what was your fit? We were moving at the time. And we said, what was your favorite time in this house? Everyone to a person, including my wife and me, we all said during the pandemic, cause we're all together and that might never happen again. And on a global scale, I think there was something and you, you nailed it. There's something about a shared experience that we all had. I would like to think the idea that our common man is in, or woman is in the same boat as we are. Therefore we have more uh, empathy towards them and love towards them. And we, we, uh, but we've seen even during the pandemic, we saw the George Floyd incident. We've seen racial uh, turmoil across the U S in general and, and, and globally, we've seen wars break out. We right now the Taliban's taking over Afghanistan because the U S pulled out. We've seen so much racial problems and strife. And then the, the uh, the election came through. Now tell me where the unification was and all of that. And there wasn't any. And so everything I feel like we learned um, was just splintered again when people started going outside. So what does that have to do with branding? I think everything, because in a way, we've just forgotten what we all commonly held on to, what we commonly thought was dear to us as humans. And my experience with my family was, gosh, being locked together was a great thing. And I know not everyone had that experience, but we enjoyed it. But there was also this thing I want to say we enjoyed togetherness. We didn't enjoy the pandemic. But when we went back out into the world, we sought out the folks that that had a similar viewpoint as us. Like we we want to be with a brand that understands that financially we might be struggling or, you know, we couldn't get our kids home because they were locked in their dorm in Boulder, Colorado or, you know, whatever it might be. The brands that showed that empathy, that showed that they understood us. Was not unlike me calling up a complete stranger in middle of South America, like you said, and and just saying, "Hey, you had the exact same experience as me. Let's talk about that." So you want you seek out that stuff. I'm a big proponent on human relationships and how we treat one another, and I think that if we reached out more, it just makes makes the world better. And we're not all going to be here that long. So brands that figure that out, um, what comes to mind is, and unfortunately, they're getting they're getting flack for it now because the, everyone thought the pandemic was over. And now it's it's kind of coming back uh, if it ever went away. But the extra commercial, the the gum commercial, where everyone come came outside and everyone starts kissing each other and seeing oh, yeah, everyone. Yeah. something joyous about that because it was a shared experience. And what extra said was, "Hey, listen, we get it because we were there too." Um, so there's a lot of things that post pandemic people just tried to figure out how to return to normalcy. And even them now they're getting crap because they even had an ad like that. And but how would they know that the Delta variant was going to take over? So what we're hearing from our long way around the horn, the long folks that we hear about in our agency and, and even just in the things we know from our colleagues and other ones is that a lot of brands are trying to get back to what they believe in. 
And some of that's been a lot of pressure with vaccinated or unvaccinated. Where What's your stand? What do you believe in? How do you treat your employees? But a lot of them are just going like, what are, why are we doing this? They were revisiting their vision and their purpose in this world. Some of them are giving more money back to their employees. Some people are changing the way they do business overseas. Some of them are letting employees stay home. And all that has a ripple effect on how we treat people. And so I like to think that we're helping a very, very small way those businesses get back to who they either always knew they could be or who they originally were so they can connect with people of a similar bent and continue to serve them. So, um, yeah, I could wax on about this forever. No, no, I think you make a fantastic point here because I, I, I think that, and I do think you're correct about the, the connection piece. I do think people, because there's so much division, there's so much strife, there's so much stuff that went along with, as you said, in parallel to the, the pandemic, um, there's uh, there's so much anger. I love the, the somebody told me uh, used a phrase recently, the recreational anger, which I just thought was a fantastic phrase. Well, it's almost yeah. like you know, people. It's a hobby to get annoyed about stuff and to be online, like having Twitter yeah. feuds and next door. Next door is incredible. You know, it used to be the whole thing about community. <laughs> now it's just people at each other's throats. It's fantastic. Yeah, exactly. Really. Another another way of arguing with people. Um, but I think there is a there is a real hunger out there for maybe things that unite us, things that make us feel good together, things that we don't have to we don't have to know everything about each other. We don't have to agree with everything about each other. But maybe and maybe brands can do that. You know, maybe I mean, take Doc. Doc we were talking about Dr. Martins, as you said, uh, um, if you gathered just a random 10 people from across the globe who love Doc Martens, you would have probably an extremely diverse group of people. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. And ironically, a lot of the people wouldn't like the other 10 or the other nine. And, yeah. and, and, and so that's one way to say how brands transcend racial barriers and political, you know, um, differences and even state and nation lines, which is really cool. Like I find that stuff fascinating, but I do think then it begs the question. And again, you could write theses on this. It begs the question, what's the social responsibility of a brand to bring that kind of, um, knowledge or education or enlightenment to bear to the market. And you can see brands like Patagonia do this and, and uh, you know, where we're concerned about the environment and, you know, there's, I think even um, somebody just came out and said, well, a lot of them are coming out now and saying they're going to reduce plastics in the environment. And, you know, obviously all the cars going more electric, but on a real human level on a deep connective level, if you had those 10 people who all love Dr. Martin's from the, from around the globe, I mean, you're probably, let me just think about this. I would venture to say that one of them was at war at one of the other nine at some point in their nation's history. And it's kind of like, what are we doing? You know? So yeah. again, there's just, gosh, there's so much we could talk about. And I know we've gone on from different directions and that's partially my fault, but. Oh no, no, it's great. I mean, brands have power behind them. You know, when, when a brand takes a stand and says, no, we're not supporting when Coca-Cola pulls out of something in Atlanta because of the politics or, or Nike stands behind Colin Kaepernick because of, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement, or somebody says, no, we're not going to treat people that way or whatever. There's something really palpable about that. And, and you know, brands are driven, driven by their archetype and the hero brands. Nike is, is one of them. It's the most obvious one. You know, when, when they do something heroic, which is in their DNA to do so, we cheer for them. We love that. And so what's the connection we have with people and brands who aren't the hero archetype, you know, who are the caregivers and who are the, you know, where in the days when we grew up, it was Smokey the Bear and Red Cross were a big deal, you know, and like, the, because we cared for people. And so I'm like, I'm not going to be the cynic and say like, we don't care for people anymore because of the pandemic or because of brands. That's not, that's not the point. But the point is there is a, there's some responsibility of a brand to bring together the, the, the people who have in common their consumption of their business. So I think there's there's something there. Uh, there's a there there. I don't know if I put my finger on it yet, but yeah. And, and what I like to think, I mean, sometimes I think yeah, yeah, companies are big grand gestures, yeah. But I like, and and that's all well and good. But I think if we go back to just for a moment before we finish, is just go back with the ten people with the Doc Martens, as you said, from total. When we distill it down and we say, okay, we may have all these differences, but here's one thing we have in common: we all love Doc, Doc Martens. So yeah. There's a there's a starting point, right? And and that's where I think that's why I absolutely do think the power of brand is is the fact that sometimes it can provide you with a starting point for a connection to somebody who maybe you would never in a million years have connected with. 
Oh, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. And the adoption of that brand by different generations is also leads to that where, um, you know, my, my, uh, my older son is, uh, way into Adidas and he wears, uh, the three stripes every bleed, the three stripes, right. Which my friends in Portland, Oregon would love. Well, well Nike's there too, but my friends are at Adidas. The, uh, you know, he wears the Adidas hat, the track suit, the shoes, the socks, his backpack, everything is Adidas. And when, when you start learning, like he had no idea who Stan Smith was or Rod Laver or right. iconic, he knows Kanye, right. But who are the people who like helped put, Adidas on the map or Pele for Pete's sakes, or even to some extent when David Beckham was, was sponsored mm -hmm. by Adidas, like those are generational gaps that the brand of Adidas helped bring education and enlightenment. Well, um, well, it's sports related. Sure. To my son, who's now 18. And he's like, wow, you like them as a kid, or <laughs> that's what that guy did. Or, and I mean, like he, and that's really cool because, and that's just a generational thing. When you're talking more latitudinally, when you're talking about people of the same, uh, maybe age and geographic location, but completely different fundamental belief system. There is a commonality there, which I think, but listen, this goes back to, do we even take the time to listen to people anymore? Do we even take the time to have that conversation? And uh, it, it's just, it's like, I don't want to turn this into like some kind of political speech, but there's something special. And I need to learn from this too. Like, it's really easy. I'm in my glass office right now and, and I can see my staff out there and I should do a better job connecting with them and my whatever. I don't do a good job of connecting with people that I see we have a common interest, no matter how small that might be, because I believe that's a mustard seed of something that can grow into something special. So um, in a perfect world, maybe we could use brands to make the world better. I don't think that's ever going to happen. So until then, we can just make the brands better themselves and hopefully they leave a good footprint behind them. Perfect. Listen, that was fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, Kyle. This has been fascinating, man. As you said, I mean, we could have gone, we could have gone on for a long time. We've gone in many different directions. And I haven't even oh. gotten to my Irish accent yet. Oh, there you go. Well, I'll probably spare people that. So, um. <laughs> I'm teasing. I'm teasing. It's very bad. It's very bad. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, what I was going to say was like all of Kyle's information is going to be below this video, all the links. But before we go, just tell people a little bit more about uh, the brand leader. Sure. Well, as you know, by now, we're a branding agency. We specialize in strategy and design. We are located in Greenville, South Carolina, but we work with international clients. Um, we uh, we just love, just like this, there's a lot of us in here who love to talk about brands from any different aspect, from design or development or copywriting. Uh, and we just love to talk to people about it, whether you hire us or not. So there's some couple free guides online. One of my favorite is the uh, it's a, what we call the ultimate guide to rebranding. You don't need a rebrand to have this be apropos to you, but it's a lot of fun insights, things we talked about, a logo is not a brand and so forth. There's another free guide in there on naming and what it takes to name a brand, the different types of names and so forth. So I'd encourage you, anyone to uh, go to thebrandleader.com, you know, pick something to read or just look at our great work from uh, from our talented designers and developers. And yeah, that would be it. And if you want to chat with us, go ahead. Um, I, I've, I've done a few of these and I've had a lot of people who just write me and just say, Hey, can you just answer this question? I'm happy to do that. We're not going to charge you. We love to talk about it. So if it works out and if the San Diego zoo is listening, call us because we have some <laughs> insights from John on, uh, on your app. Yeah. I'll probably have to go there and under an assumed name next time, but uh, that's okay. As long as they don't put me in the gorilla uh, enclosure, I'll be good. <laughs> Because <laughs> yeah, actually, last time we were there, we were watching some of the gorillas. They were having a pretty good fight with each other. They're ambushing each other. It got pretty intense. So uh, exactly, wow. that's probably what they have lined up for me. Um, all right. Well, listen, Kyle. Thanks again. This is fantastic, uh, and I will see you all for another interview really soon. Thank you.